Hello, everyone. My name is Becca Semmel. I'm one of the student co-coordinators for the Winter Roundtable. And I'm so happy to introduce Wesley Lowry as one of our keynotes for the Winter Roundtable Conference. Uh, Wesley is also our 14th annual Social, Social Justice Action Award recipient. The Winter Roundtable instituted the Social Justice Action Award to honor the contributions of individuals who have exemplified social change through their work. Previous recipients of this prestigious award include William Cross, Daryl Sue, and Patricia Arredondo. Wesley's work makes him the ideal recipient for the Social Justice Action Award. Wesley is a national writer for the Washington Post and has been the lead writer on Black Lives Matter movement. In 2016, Wesley and his team of fellow reporters were awarded the Pulitzer Prize and George Polk Awards for their coverage of fatal police shootings. Under Wesley's leadership, the Washington Post published a series on police shootings and created a database containing the details of 990 fatal police shootings across the United States. This had never been done before, and Wesley and his team worked to identify and describe trends in the data. Wesley recently published a book titled They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement. The book describes Wesley's travels from shooting to shooting between 2014 and 2015, and has been called electric and was celebrated for his warm, humane tone while reporting on people and their experiences. Wesley's work has also appeared in the Boston Globe, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Guardian. Wesley has accumulated quite a few accolades, including being named the 2014 Emerging Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists, and more importantly, being the most accomplished person from our graduating class at Shaker Heights High School. <laughs> Wesley and I went to high school together, and I can confidently say that no one is surprised at his success and the incredible activism work with which he is engaged. Wesley's writing brings up important issues and current events and puts a spotlight on issues of oppression and injustice at the national level. Please join me in welcoming Wesley Lowry. Well, it's not every day you get to get introduced by someone who you rode the middle school bus with, and so that's pretty, <laughs> it's, uh, pretty exciting. Well, first of all, thank you all for hosting me. I really appreciate it. It's a really great opportunity to talk um, with you all, and I'm really looking forward to, um, uh, you know, right now I'm kind of in the middle of doing a lot of talking, a lot of book stuff, a lot of uh, conversations coming out at the end of Black History Month um, is a solid time if you're someone who talks about issues of race and oppression, you end up doing a lot of talks. But this was one of the ones on my schedule I was most excited for because of uh, kind of the quality of intellect that's in the room. Um, and so I want to say up front um, that once I'm done kind of spieling for a little bit, I'm really excited and really looking forward to being a little more interactive and having some conversations with you all um, and doing, you know, kind of questions and back and forth and conversations. And so um, I'm probably going to save about half of the time for that. And so definitely if you guys, I know you've been sitting in conversations and having conversations and, and hearing people talk. And, and I know that um, after a few days of conference, there can be a lot of built up desire to, to have conversation. And so I'd love to, to do that and kind of facilitate some of that with this keynote. But I usually start um, when I talk about the work I do by giving a little background of who I am and, and why uh, and how I ended up doing the job that I wanted to do. Um, I am good at exactly one thing, and that thing is writing for newspapers. I'm not good at pretty much anything else. Uh, I worked for my uh, middle school newspaper, my high school newspaper, um, I, in my college newspaper. and. Um, in all of those cases, my devotion to those newspapers led me to almost not graduate in all of those various points because I didn't really love science or math, um, but I was pretty good at, at being at the paper. Um, and I, so I had the, the privilege of knowing from a very young age what it was I wanted to do. Um, and, and, and what, how I wanted, my, what I wanted my career to look like. I knew I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. I knew that I wanted to use that type of platform to cover uh, stories of people who looked like me, who looked like my family, um, who, who otherwise perhaps might not have their stories told. But I always, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do that. Um, and so I, Initially thought maybe I wanted to be a metro reporter and work in a big city, get to know, get to know that city really well. Next, I thought maybe I wanted to be a business reporter. Um, and then finally, I settled on politics, right? Because politics is sexy and it's fun. Um, you know, I, I remember watching in 2004 and 2008 all the other reporters and they're, you know, filing dispatches from Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and I was like, I want to be that guy, right? And, and it takes a certain type of, uh, it takes a certain type of, um, 
<laughs> I don't know, weird shortcoming to, to watch people having to watch a campaign rally over and over and over again and say, I want to be that guy. But I, that, was, that was me. I wanted to cover politics. I was really excited for it. And so I spent most of my career coming out of college attempting to position myself to cover the 2016 campaign. Right? I uh, graduated and went to the Los Angeles Times where I worked in, in the City Hall Bureau for a little bit covering local politics. Then I took a job at the Boston Globe where I covered city politics. I covered a mayor's race and a governor's race. Um, also got to contribute to our coverage of the Boston Marathon bombings and, and a few other big stories. And then I got a call from the Washington Post in late 2013. And, and they said, you know, we know you love politics. We know you're into it. We know you want to go on the presidential campaign. Come down cover Congress for us for a year, and you know, if all goes well, we can put you on the presidential trail. And so I'd done it, I'd made it, I was so excited, I took this job at the Washington Post. Now, mind you, I didn't know anything about Congress at all at the time, I had no clue how Congress worked, I still don't really know how Congress works. Um, but I was so excited to be this national political reporter for the Washington Post, it's what I've been working towards. And so I spent most of 2014 covering Congress. Now. I, I, what's interesting about Congress is that, and, and what's interesting about D.C. is, in, in D.C. politics, is that every issue comes through, uh, comes through Capitol Hill. And so being a congressional reporter can mean any number of different things. I know congressional reporters who specialize in immigration or in, uh, congressional reporters who specialize in trade. Um, I know congressional reporters who specialize in the politics of Congress, right? Uh, what are the caucuses doing? Uh, who's going to be elected to leadership? The kind of backbiting of the Hill. And so it provided me a really interesting opportunity to be able to use this perch at the Washington Post to start trying to tell stories that maybe the other congressional reporters weren't telling. One of the big things I focused on that year was there was a debate or an effort to get Congress to renew federal long-term unemployment benefits. Now, this wasn't a particularly sexy story on the Hill at the time when they're fighting about immigration reform and things like that, but I knew it was a story that impacted uh, people who, who needed a voice in, in Washington. And so I remember I, I found myself uh, tracking down all of these Facebook groups. So essentially, the way this worked was that most states provide a certain set of uh, uh, long, um, unemployment benefits, but they end. They cut off at a certain time. And so during the recession, what DC had done, what the Congress had done, is it had provided an additional set of several months because they understood that people were out of work for longer periods of time, and then Congress allowed those benefits to expire. And so you had these groups of people who were sitting in Facebook groups, were in these email chains together, and some of them were literally watching C-SPAN every single day to see, maybe today will be the day that these benefits are renewed. Um, and, and so I remember telling some of those stories, and. And so what we did was for, for one of them, I mean, like I said, first I joined their Facebook groups and started talking to people and said, hey, you know, do you mind, can, I, can I tell your story? What, what is this like for you? And, and then I remember we went and found a woman in Maryland and we Ubered over to her house and hung out with her and her son and, and wrote about it. And she was one of the people who was every day, left her TV on C-SPAN because she was hoping uh, that, one, that one day she'd turn over the TV and they'd be voting to renew these benefits that she, her and her family needed uh, to, to stay above water. And, I remember in that moment uh, feeling bad, feeling frustrated, because I knew that that's not how that was going to work. Okay? I knew that at no point was she going to turn over and that they were going to be having this vote. Right? Um, but it, I, so we wrote this story up, and I remember the, the next day walking through the halls of the Capitol building and some fairly prominent other reporters coming up to me. That was a really good story. You know, how did you find... How did you find those, that woman? How did you find those people? What's interesting about a lot of political reporting is that we write about things that impact real people, but too often aren't actually talking to those people. I know immigration reporters who've never interviewed an immigrant, right? I know, um, you know this was long-term unemployment um, had, was something that had been covered by many economic reporters, um, but those stories were lacking uh, the realities of the actual uh, long-term unemployed people. And so how can we tell that story without including those perspectives? I always wanted to, even when I was doing politics, I always thought it was important to try to tell the stories of real human beings. Right? I think the power and the purpose of the press in a democracy very often is to lend platform to people whose voices otherwise not, might not be heard, right? Um, is to tell your story in the pages of the Washington Post as opposed to you t trying to tell your own story and perhaps people not listening or hearing it. So that was all 
nice. I felt good about myself. I had these kind of lofty ideals, but at the end of the day, I still was covering politics and I loved it, right? I, I was going on the, the TV shows every day, getting in the arguments, kind of, you know, recycling the conventional wisdom of the day and gearing up and getting ready to go out the 2016 presidential campaign trail, which I was excited for. I was convinced that this was going to be like the most substantive, issued-based uh, presidential campaign of my lifetime. And I just knew that it was going to be so important that I was there to, you know. And, and, um, and so I'm, in, I'm in, uh, in early August 2014, I'm in Michigan. Uh, my grandparents uh, live in De outside of Detroit. And so I was there covering a congressional primary in some race that no one, I use this example all the time, and I literally don't remember who was running or who won. Like it, it feels like a world away, but I'm up covering some primary in some congressional race that no one remembers. And as I'm, as I'm sitting there, I, I've been out all day for the last few days covering things, and I go over to my grandparents' house for dinner because um, I'm in town, and I remember as they are kind of fiddling around, uh, setting the table or getting ready, I pulled my phone out and I'm scrolling uh, Instagram because I'm like a social media addict. And so, I, this is a Saturday in the summer, and so I don't know, I mean, you guys are, this is a very prestigious group of people. I'm not sure what your Instagram feeds look like on a Saturday, but my Instagram feed on a Saturday uh, looks like a lot of uh, very fun photos from the night before, usually, right? My, my friends who are at a party, my friends who are out at the bars or clubs, people who went out to a sporting event, maybe, right? It's, it's a very... Uh, jubilant series of photos and videos, right? And so as I'm scrolling, scrolling Instagram, and I get to a series of videos that have been posted by a good friend of mine, uh, Brittany. Now, Brittany, I was actually with her earlier today at the last event I was at. Brittany um, was a reporter in St. Louis. She was an anchor for, and a weekend anchor for uh, the local CBS affiliate in St. Louis. Now, Brittany, um, we'd met each other early in college. We did a student program together. Um, we're part of a kind of a really tight-knit group of kind of younger black journalists who've known each other since we were like, you know, 18 and 19. It's like an older sister to me almost. Uh, but I saw these, the series of photos and videos, and I was like, and, and they stood out in, in my feet. Now, Brittany, earlier that day, had been at her engagement photo shoot. Um, and she was engaged, now married, but was engaged to a good friend of ours, Mike. And so they are um, standing next to like what a waterfall or some pillars or whatever, you, you know, they chose for their engagement shoot. And she gets, you know, you know how those pictures go, right? And so she, she, gets, a she gets this text message from a source. Now, Brittany's you know, a St. Louis reporter who lives in a suburb called Ferguson. I'd never heard of it before. And she gets a text from a, a source of her, someone in the community she knows, who says, do you know what's going on? She's like, no, what are you talking about? And she goes, there's, a, there's been a shooting, and the body seems to still be in the street, and people are really upset. You guys should check this out. And so Brittany pauses the photos and walks, walks over to the side and calls the newsroom and says, you know, is anyone going to Ferguson for the shooting? People seem upset. And they're like, ah, oh, who knows? Maybe we'll send someone, maybe we won't. You know, we're not really sure if it's a big story yet. We're, we're, not, we're not sure. Now, Brittany, that's one of the things I love about Brittany. Brittany cannot take no for an answer um, at all. Uh, when Brittany knows she's right, she knows she is right. Um, and so Brittany is, is frustrated with that answer. And so she turns to Mike and she goes, I got to go. And she gets in their car and leaves him with the photographer in the waterfall <laughs> and <laughs> drives back into Ferguson, where she is the first reporter on the scene um, to what ends up being one of the biggest stories um, in a kind of a modern American history. Um, and so as I'm scrolling an hour or two later, what I'm seeing, you have to remember, 2014 doesn't feel like that long ago, but even in terms of technology, it was a long time ago. In 2014, if you wanted to post a video to the internet, you usually posted it on Instagram. Snapchat didn't really exist yet. You couldn't do Twitter video, all this live streaming, Facebook Live, none of that was a thing yet, right? You were either using Vine, which is now gone, or you were using Instagram video. And so as I'm scrolling, I'm seeing these, these videos and these photos of a crowd gathering of police dogs, of this m woman who is hysterical in this pain and trauma. And she's jumping up and down and saying her son had been killed. This photo of a man who has taken a piece of cardboard and who has written, the Ferguson police killed my unarmed son today. Now those, all of those images ended up going 
relatively viral. They were they became this first images we saw from Ferguson, um, and again, all of those published by Brittany on her Instagram feed. And so I remember I'm watching this, I'm seeing this, and I could tell that this just, even through my phone, I could tell this just felt different. You know, when I'd worked in Boston, I'd covered police shootings previously, and I'd covered murders. I'd been a Metro reporter, I'd, I'd been to crime scenes, I'd been to community meetings, but there, there was this feeling even that this felt different. And I've talked to Brittany about this, I read about it in the book, in my book as well, that she'd also had covered police shootings before. She'd also covered communities in pain and with trauma before, but she could tell in this moment. She tells me, she goes, you know, after, all, after any shooting, the community comes out and they say, we're demanding justice and we're going to stay here until we get it. And usually one week later or two weeks later, everyone else has kind of gone on with their life. And what she said was she could tell from this, those very first moments as the residents came out, as they were talking, as they were upset, as they were angry, that this story was going to be bigger. The, so I'm, I leave Michigan and I, I fly back to D.C. I, I land on early Monday morning. Uh, I was a few years younger then, and so I would do dumb things like fly overnight and then go straight to work because um, I thought that was cool. Uh, that is a terrible thing that I can't do anymore. Um, the, but the <laughs> I get in the office Monday morning, and on Sunday night, um, which now had been two days after Michael Brown had been killed, the anger had not subsided. The people were still in the streets. The police were still responding with force. And by Sunday night, the Quick Trip gas station, uh, a block away from where Michael Brown was killed, was burned to the ground. And what that meant was, and it's a sad commentary sometimes on those of us in you know, the media, um, but the death of Michael Brown, his body in the street, wasn't necessarily enough for a reporter like me to start covering the story. I was interested in it. I was following it. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily a Washington Post story. But once a gas station got burned down, it was certainly a Washington Post story. Um, and so as I come into work on Monday morning, I walk over to one of my colleagues, Mark, who I work very closely with, and, and, um, and I'm saying, you know, how can I help you out on this? You know, I'm, I'm a politics reporter still. I don't, this is not what I cover yet. Um, but one of the lessons I learned very early on that a lot of journalism success is about scheming your way into the story that's not really your story, right? And so I, and so I walk over to Mark, and I'm like, what can I do? How, how about I call the Missouri congressional delegation? Maybe they're going to call for like a DOJ invest. This is a very like Washington Post scoop, right? I could like, we could find out the feds are going to do something, and we could break that. And as we're having this conversation, an editor walks, overhears us and walks by and goes, could you just get on a plane to Missouri? We really should send somebody. You should, we should just go. Now, I did not want to go to Missouri. Um, I, like I said, had just landed back, I, but I still had a bag packed from this last trip. And so I said, all right, let's go. And so I get in the cab, go to DCA, and I'm on the next flight to St. Louis. And as I get there, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm boarding the plane, I remember I'm texting my friends and uh, my girlfriend at the time and telling them, like, hey, I'm going to Missouri. I got to go to this thing. This is a, it's a Monday. And I'm like, oh, I, we had big plans. My buddies host a, <laughs> hosted a, a brunch on the weekends. So on Saturday, we were hosting this thing. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be back by Saturday. Don't worry about it. Like, I'll see you guys in a few days. I was convinced I was going to Ferguson for three days. I thought I would land. Um, maybe write a story for tomorrow, and then spend a few days interviewing people, collecting story, you know, collecting anecdotes maybe for a big weekend piece. Um, so I thought I was going for three days. I ended up there for more or less for three months. Um, I, as I landed, I <laughs> jumped in a rental car and went to what was the first press conference of Michael Brown's family. Uh, Benjamin Crump, who was their attorney, had just arrived. And their hostess, the first time they're addressing the media, the first time they're addressing the shooting, and talking about who this young man is who's been killed. And it was, it was fascinating because it was both fascinating and not in how routine it felt, right? I'd had this feeling that this was going to be so different. But as I sat in this, in this row in these seats, it felt like I'd been here before. It felt like so many of the other press conferences I'd been to. Here you had a family heartbroken and grieving, wearing t-shirts with their son's face on them that they've you know, just have had printed today, talking about the need for justice, talking about their pain, talking about the anger, and talking about how the media, they felt to demonize their son already. And then comes the attorney, talking about how this is not an isolated case, but rather this is the next name in a long line. Now this is years before many of the names that we would now associate with this, but, but even then they were, it was not the first name. And so as I leave the press conference, I, I drive over to uh, I, I drive over to a 
community forum that the NAACP had been hosting. They had, at, much like us, after they had seen kind of this sustained pain and anger and trauma, they said, we need to send, we need to send folks out. And so the national NAACP president came in, met with local leaders, and he was going to have this community forum to try to get a sense of what's going on, hopefully calm things a little bit, provide some information. And so I'm driving over to this thing, and as I pull up, I see 100, maybe 200 people standing in the, in the parking lot. Now, I can be a little logistically challenged, and so I assumed that that meant that, especially with the time zone change, I assumed I had just shown up either an hour late or an hour early, right? They must have gotten out already, and that's why everyone's standing out here. So I get out of my car, and, I, and I'm, walking, I'm walking up to the door, and what I realize is, is not that, because my assumption had been that either the meeting has already been over and I've missed it, or they just haven't unlocked the doors yet. It hasn't started yet, and so everyone's waiting. In reality, the church had been filled to capacity. There were already six or 700 people inside, and these extra 100 people had decided they would stand here in the parking lot um, and wait until the meeting was over so someone coming out could tell them what was said. Now, that, that stood out to me. You know, like I said, I've covered community meetings. I've covered communities after pain or after trauma. And I had never, one, seen that many people at a meeting, but two, that many people who decided that well, we didn't get in and we're going to stand here on this asphalt in the 100-degree August heat and wait for an hour and a half so we can be told what happened. I knew at this moment that this shooting had sparked and it had spoken to an underlying feeling and pain and trauma that that was about something much larger than this incident. I mean, at the time, we didn't even really know anything about this shooting. All the, all the residents knew was that someone had been killed and that they were not receiving answers for it. So one of the things that, one of the people I always like to talk about when I talk about Ferguson is the next woman I'm about to introduce. And um, she, was, Janetta Elsey, was a day one protester. She showed up the day Michael Brown was killed and was in the streets. Uh, and she became someone who I got to know very well and know very well now, but at the time, she was just this woman on Twitter who seemed like she was everywhere. We were, I remember as I'm getting on this airplane to go to Missouri, I said, said something, you know, hey, who should I, I'm going, I'm going to Ferguson, who should I talk to, who should I meet up on the ground? Everyone's like, find this girl. She's like, and so I'm scrolling through her Twitter feed, and she is, it says she seems to be everywhere. There's a picture of the police. There's a picture of the body. There's a protest at this time. We're hearing that they're gathering here. We're hearing that there's tear gassing here. I'm like, who is this woman, and how does she know everything? And so I, and so I DM her. I slide into her DMs on Twitter, and I'm like, hey, um, coming to, I'm coming, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm pitching her. I'm trying to convince her to talk to me. So I'm like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, coming, to, I'm coming to Ferguson, because a, a lot of her tweets had also been critical of media coverage. I'm like, I'm coming to Ferguson. I'm on the plane right now. You know, I tell the story the right way. need to meet up with you. need to know what you... She's like, all right, awesome. I'm going to be at the community meeting with the NAACP. Meet me there. And I'm like, awesome. I'll see you there. And so Netta, I tease her about this now. She immediately took our DM conversation and started like live tweeting it and saying, like, and now a Washington Post reporter is coming here to tell the story the right way. Can you believe this, guys? I, I found this tweet like, like three years later, and I sent it to her like, thanks. Thanks for that. Right? <laughs> it's, it's so... It's, so now I'm at this meeting, and I, and I find, and I find Janetta. Um, and, and what I love about Janetta is she is, people use the word raw, and I don't know that I like that word for her, but she is, she is the most frank and straightforward, matter-of-fact person I've ever met in my entire life. And so I, t I told her, I was like, hey, I'm going to be the light-skinned guy in the orange sweater. I'll, I, I'll come find you. Blah, blah. And so I walk up to her, and she goes, you didn't say you were that light-skinned. <laughs> and I was like... And I knew, I was like, all right, we're going to be friends. Like, this is going to be great. <laughs> and so she goes, and I was like, oh, you know, well, I'm mixed, blah, blah, And she goes, okay, well, we already have a white friend named Wes, so you can be 0.5 Wes, and we'll hang out with I was like, geez, you're just you're giving it to me, right? And so I go, to, I, go to, I go to Netta, and I was like, all right, so I need you to take me to, I need you to take me to, into Ferguson, right? This, this meeting had been in the next town over, right? What we weren't, it's like, I need you to take me, let's go into the city. I want to see where everything happened. Show me where the shooting was, where the, where the violence was last night. Blah, blah. And so she, we, get in the, we get in the rental car, and then we drive in this city. And, um, and, 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 as we, and as we pull up, we park, and we start walking towards Canfield Drive, which is this sleepy side street where Michael Brown had been killed. And as we're walking, you know, I start, I start doing some interviews. Netta's handing out water to people um, and making sure people are all right. 
and I'm, I'm interviewing this man who, who lives on in the corner house. He, he lives in this home, and he's come outside to kind of keep an eye over the chaos developing, right? Last, last night, someone had broken a window or something. You know, he wanted to make sure everything was all right. And so as I'm interviewing him, uh, I'm, you know, I'm standing and facing, you know, this is another lesson learned, right, is to be actually three-dimensionally aware of your surroundings. Right? So I'm standing and interviewing this guy, and we're talking, and Netta's behind me doing whatever she's doing, talking to people, handing out water, making fun of me. Like, I don't know what she's doing, right? And so I'm interviewing this guy, and behind us, everything is descending into what is the third night of a physical confrontation between the police and and the residents of Ferguson. The first night being when the police killed Michael Brown. The second night being um, these, these physical clashes and what we were soon going to find out was that this night things would escalate to tear gas. And so, and so as we're standing here, there's a, a group of young men, um, residents who'd been outside, um, who had been demonstrating and chanting and a line of police. And the police are telling them, you gotta get out of here, you gotta leave. Uh, and, the, and they're saying, we live here, where do you want us to go? We're not, we're not going anywhere. You leave. And at some point, as I'm doing this interview, uh, the police had decide that they, that they had had enough of yelling, and they start shooting tear gas into the crowds. And so I'm, so I'm sitting here, and, and Netta behind me, get some tear gas lands near her, and she gets, and police also shoot these rubber-encoded, uh, we call them rubber bullets, but they're not really bullets. They're these kind of projectiles. So she gets hit with one of these things, so she's like, I'm out of here. She's screaming. She's running up the street. And I'm completely oblivious and in my zone here until the man who I'm interviewing pushes me out of the way into this bush. I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? And because tear gas had landed at his feet and he was moving me out of the way. And that began what ended up being weeks. I mean, I, I, remember I was out there for hours that night, watch in this neighborhood I'd never been in before, in the suburbs with these windy streets and cul-de-sacs, trying to figure out where I was and how to get out. And I remember thinking that this was just not something I'd ever experienced or ever seen before. That this felt like something out of a different country, out of a movie. It just didn't feel like suburban, the suburban Midwest. The, later on that night, I find my way out and we find Netta and she's freaking out. She's like, I, she still says, you know, the first time we hung out, you got me shot, is what she always says. <laughs> she's I'm like, that. Like I said, she's very sweet to me, right? And, and the, um, <laughs> but when I end up finding her, and I, and I remember talking to, and this is gonna kind of the, one of the points of what I want to talk about, but I remember finding her, and, and we end up over the course of what's now been three years building a, a relationship, you know, uh, being uh, not only a source journalist relationship, but, you know, people who I think consider each other friends. And, and I remember when I sat down to write the book, and, this is, and Netta had been profiled and profiled and written about, and I said, you know, I want to get at why you were there. You know, one of the reasons that I wrote my book is that I still, having written probably thousands of articles on Black Lives Matter, on protest, on policing, I still get emails and calls from our readers at the Washington Post all the time. And they, and they say, I don't get it. Why are these people so upset? Why are people in the streets? What, what is, you know, but didn't that guy really deserve it? Or what, how are these things linked? How can you, and, and I would get frustrated, you know, I'm, dumb enough to respond to all the emails I get. And so I'm, I'm going back and forth with people. But it, I always found it so frustrating because I feel like it's the role of a journalist, the role of a writer to explain um, that if someone reads my piece and they come away not understanding, I've had a failure of communication somehow, right? If you can sit down and read my piece on the protest movement and not understand the protest movement afterwards, I feel like I've failed. And so what I had taken to doing was encouraging these readers to not start by looking at the group of 10,000 people in the street, but not even to start by looking at a group of 100 people in the street, but rather, can you understand one of these demonstrators? Can you understand why one of these people is in the street? I, there was a line, and I, I always mean to look it back up, that by a conservative commentator who at one point wrote that he'd reached the point that he could no longer believe that everyone in the street was making it up. That he, that he said, you know what? I don't really think racism is this huge purveying thing. I think it's overblown. But if there are 10,000 people in the street and all of them are saying this is a real issue, they're not all, you know, and they, they like to hold up prominent civil rights activists to like beat them. You know, they can't all be Al Sharptons or Jesse Jacksons. They can't all be people who I think are trying to monetize this. Someone, that woman and her kid, they, this is a real feeling. 
This is a real perception. This is a reality. Like, not everyone in the street can be lying. They can't all be making it up. And so what I tell people is I say, start by understanding this story of one demonstrator, of one protester, of one resident. And once you can understand one person and their experience and their trauma and their pain, now you can understand 10, and then perhaps you can understand the 10,000. So uh, as I'm sitting to start write, writing a book on Black Lives Matter and on the protest movement, I'm, I'm going back to these people who I've met in these cities, to DeRay McKesson and Bree Newsom and, uh, and Janetta Elzey. And I call her and I say, you know, I just want to talk about how you ended up there that day. You know, you're a day one protester. How, what, what was going through your mind that day? And what, was, and what had happened in your life previously that you had decided this was the moment? That you were going to show up, you were going to take pictures, you were going to criticize the media coverage, that, the, that this was something that you felt so passionately about that you had to do it. Because that's one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, there are very few, if any, professional protesters, right? People who take to the streets are, are your doctors and lawyers and students and nurses. and it, it's, it's people who've decided that they are going to use their own resource now to attempt to make a change. Right? And so I start talking to Netta. And, Netta. and Netta's talking about, to understand her, you have to understand where she grew up. She grew up in North County, St. Louis. Uh, we now know that North County, St. Louis is a place that had massive inequity issues and has massive inequity issues as it relates to how fines and fees are applied, to how traffic stops are issued, to how their warrant system um, is, um, is implemented. At the time Michael Brown was killed, there were more active warrants in the city of Ferguson, Missouri than there were residents in the city of Fer Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, that they would get you, um, and what you also know, if you know St. Louis, is that, as is the case in many Midwestern cities, the public transportation was built essentially to exclude certain sections, and by certain sections, black sections, from having access to the city and to jobs, right? And so St. Louis is a place where you have to have a car if you are working, um, especially if you are a working black or brown person. And so because of that, it, with a, especially as it, as a, with a lower middle class um, set of residents, you would see, and, and you would have these municipalities that were just speed traps, essentially, um, where they would fund their cities off of the revenue from speeding tickets, is that you would have these speed traps, and someone would get, someone would get pulled over, and they'd get a ticket, and they would stack the tickets. And on top of that, we see your registration's, out of, your, your registrations overdue, or your windshield is cracked. Um, and, and usually, uh, what we know is that you know, there are multiple reasons why your registration might be overdue. One, because like all of us, you've got a letter in the mail saying to renew it and you procrastinated it for two months. Or two, because you don't have the $75 right now, right? You don't get paid till next week or you, or you need your money right now to do something else. And, and so in many cases, you have people who are breaking regulations because of their poverty. And now they've been given three speeding tickets a speeding ticket and a registration ticket. Now they owe $300 or $400. Now the person who can't pay the 75 can't pay the 400. So now you have, in a week or in two weeks, their license gets revoked. Um, if their, their fees go unpaid, they now have a warrant out for them. And so what it meant was that at most periods in time, for most black residents of North County, uh, Missouri, or North County, St. Louis, any interaction with the police could lead to a night in jail. Getting pulled over would, would mean you, get, you getting hauled out of your car and taken to jail, and maybe missing work that day and losing your job, maybe not picking your kid up from the school. It created this massive anxiety about interacting with the police in any capacity, and that's before any conversation about what the tone and tenor of the police interaction might be. But also to understand Janetta Elsie is to under, understand what her year had been like, not just her her life. You know, earlier that year, uh, Janetta had lost her mother, um, who was a single mother. And so they had been at times close, at times not so close. We all know, we all remember what we were like as teenagers and how at times we were close to our parents and other times not really. But her mother, after a long illness, had, had died earlier this year. And this was a very kind of traumatic moment for Netta as she, you know, she's 25 at the time, and is back from school and is really a, a woman for the first time in terms of interacting with the world. And she's lost kind of her guiding light. And a week or two after her mother dies, one of her best friends, Stefan Avery Hart, is shot and killed by the police. Now, Netta did what we always caution and tell ourselves that we're not supposed to do. 
Um, I can't blame her. She read every comment. She read every, every article. She wanted all of the information about how her friend had died. She, she wanted answers. And she wasn't getting very many of them. But what she was seeing was how her, her friend, this person she was close to, this compassionate, gentle man she knew, was being called a thug, was, was, was being said he deserved it. He was the media at the time erroneously reported that he was an ex, it was a felon, he was not. And, and so she watched this with this anger and this frustration. How could they talk about this person who I love so much this way? So you fast forward six months to August 9th when Michael Brown is killed. And that is sitting in her grandmother's house, she's on a couch. And she sees on Twitter all these people talking about this shooting. The police had killed someone over in Ferguson. She lives a town away. And in that moment, I asked her, I said, so what gets you from the couch into the streets that day? Why do you start doing this? Why do you become the person who you become, this face of Ferguson in many ways? And she says to me, I wasn't going to let them do to this boy what they'd done to Stephen or Stefan. That I, he'd been villainized and he'd been hurt, that I'd watched the police lie about things, I'd watched the residents not understand, and, and I, couldn't, I felt like I couldn't stop it. And in this moment with this new kid, Michael, I feel like I, I can change this. If I'm there telling the truth, people can't lie about what's happening. What, one of the things I think, you know, I get questions a lot when I do conversations. I mean, I do a lot of kind of like state of the media talks and stuff like that, right? And one of the things that I talk about a lot, or a question I get very often, is why this moment? Police shootings weren't new. They're not, they, you know, this is not, didn't start in 2014. This is something in a reality that has existed uh, in America forever, especially as it relates to the racial disparities and interactions and, and fatal force. Why all of a sudden in 2014 does this become the leading domestic issue in the United States of America? Now, I've got a few theories on this, but I, but I think that in many ways it's a lot of interacting and intersecting uh, moments. I, I think that, you know, what we know is that disparate police interaction, uh, racial profiling and police impunity are issues that black communities and brown communities have known about forever. Um, it's something they've talked about forever. The idea of you getting pulled over and how you're and how you're interacted with the idea of someone spending a night in jail because because an officer perhaps overreacted in an interaction, maybe your uncle or your brother not coming home because of an interaction with an officer. But why? But equally, while black communities have known this, white communities historically have denied it or refused to see it. That this cannot be true or is not true or this isn't what it's like where I live. My police interact with me this way. So, so you, mu you all must be making this up. Why then do we, do we take a Ferguson, Missouri, or a Baltimore, or a Milwaukee, a Charlotte, a Cleveland, and, and why do these cases now become national rallying cries that then caramelize into a national movement, right? What I think is unique about the Ferguson moment, and because I, I, I believe, you know, my there's a debate often inside movement spaces about you know when did the when did the movement start and who found it and I kind of and, and I and I think and there's value value in that debate. Um, but what I what I say is when I, and what I think is that in many ways the the what we see as a movement now was conceived in the early Obama years with Oscar Grant and Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis, but that it was birthed. It gave it it, it physically manifested in Ferguson, Missouri, and the subsequent cities. And, and why? You know, in the past, the ability to get a story out was so contingent, in some ways, and I, don't, I mean this not self-importantly, but on people like me, that if something was happening in your community, if something was happening where you live, a justice or an injustice, you could call the local media, you could send them a press release, you could email them, you could write them a letter, and you would have to hope that some reporter or some editor would say, you know what, you're right, this is a story, we should cover this. That the power rested solely in a certain group of people, and otherwise you would have a difficulty getting a story out. That we existed in an ivory tower of news, essentially, right? Where the journalists, the reporters, the media are sitting in a tower dictating to you what is news and what is not. Because if we decide it's not news, you won't read about it in the paper tomorrow, you won't see it on, uh, on television. What 
the moment we exist in now because of both smartphones and social media has completely leveled that ivory tower. We live in a world where people themselves, who otherwise would not have had publishing power or platform, can document things happening around them in real time. And if the story is compelling, if the content is compelling, it can be seen by the entire world without the participation of a single media organization. The first images of Michael Brown didn't come from, from Brittany or from me or from the local news. It came from this guy, Emmanuel Farrow, who was sitting, it's a rapper in St. Louis, who was sitting in his apartment, looking out his window and watched Michael Brown be shot and killed and took pictures and said, oh my God, what's going on? Right, those first images, those first correspondents on the ground were people like Netta, not classically trained journalists, but people who pulled their phones out and took pictures of things and said, can you believe this? Can you, can you believe what we're looking at? I, th I think that that is important, and I think it's important in us understanding how, uh, how this moment came about and, and what its significance is. I, I think that, you know, I, I got in an argument once, or not an argument, a, a, a debate with an activist friend of mine. And he, because um, I used to use, as a lot of us like to use, this turn of phrase, you know, we got to give voice to the voiceless. And, like, and that social media has given, now given voice to voiceless people. And what he pushed back on it, he said he didn't like the construction of the voiceless, but rather the unheard, right? That, that people in communities were not mute. They were not voiceless. It's just some other people weren't listening to them. And some of those other people include the media very often, that what we saw in this moment was that because of the tools being available broadly, you no longer required, a you no longer had to convince me that this was a story for the world to know Michael Brown's name, or Tamir Rice's name, or John Crawford's name, or Eric Gardner's name, right? And, and so that these stories that otherwise were not, were not being told because of negligence, now were being told. So what is the role of a media then in a world in which people, news has become so democratized? I think that, because I think there still is a strong role. And so I want to talk about one project we did um, that I think helps fit that, and then I'm going to shut up and we're going to talk back and forth a little bit, because I'm already tired of my voice. The, in those early days in Ferguson, I would, you know, I'm running around, I'm interviewing residents, I'm interviewing protesters and demonstrators, and I don't even like the word protesters, I use it all the time, but like, in many cases, this is someone who has come out of their home seen a child dead in the street, turned to the police and said, why is the kid dead? Um, you know, and, and they become protesters in our turn of phrase. But in reality, these are just residents and humans, right? But I'm in it doing these interviews, and we're having these conversations, and, and what they're saying to us is that, look, this is a crisis. Unarmed black men are being killed in the streets every day. We have to do something about it. And so being a reporter, I call the police and the police chief or the police union, and they go, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, unarmed black people definitely aren't getting gunned down the street every day. Um, we barely ever kill anybody, and when we do, they're definitely not unarmed, and they're definitely not black, and if they were, they probably deserved it anyway. Don't worry about it, right? And so I'd write these stories, and I'd file them. I do a lot of my writing on my phone, actually, when I'm on the, in the field like that. So I'd type up these stories and send them to my editors, and being good, smart editors, they'd say, well, which of those things is true? It can't both be true that unarmed black people are being executed in the streets every day, and that police shootings are rare and never happen. Which one is it? How can we answer this question? So we start by going to the Missouri Secretary of State. We say, what can, what can you tell us about police shootings in Missouri? I mean, you guys must have a, you, know, you must have files, you must know. And they're like, ah, oh, we don't really know. I like, oh, that's weird. So we're like, All right, let's call Eric Holder, let's call like, the Justice Department. I mean, they gotta know, right? Us being kind of naive media, right to know folks, we're like, there must be a file cabinet with a manila envelope for every single police shooting, right? I mean, like, of course, and I can march in and be like, I'm gonna records request this, and you have to show me it. So we call the DOJ, and they're like, well, we have a number, but you really shouldn't use it because it's way wrong. I'm like, what do you mean we shouldn't use it because it's wrong? What are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, well, we don't really know. We have this voluntary thing where people can tell us if they kill people, but they don't really have to, so don't. I'm like, wait, what? And my editors, meanwhile, are just like freaking out. They're like, wait, what? There's no way. They have to know. They have to have the numbers. Make it up. You, you haven't asked them enough. I'm like, no, I've asked them. I, I asked. Like, they don't, they don't have it. And so we start digging around in this, and what we realize is that they were telling us the truth, that there was no comprehensive 
roster or record keeping of who was killed by the police in the United States of America. That in a country where we measure and count everything, we know exactly how many shark attacks there were off of the coast of Los Angeles last year. We know literally to the barrel how much wheat is in Iowa right now. But we do not know definitively how many people were shot and killed by police officers last year. That in the beauty of our federalist system, Policing is a local state's rights issue, and the feds cannot demand any information of any police department. And, and that the only number that existed was this voluntary, self-reported number um, where departments could tell the Department of Justice uh, if they'd killed people or not. Well, according to those numbers, uh, Tamir Rice was never killed, nor was Eric Gardner. Um, according to those numbers, the police haven't killed a single person in the state of Florida in the last decade. Um, <laughs> So we knew those numbers were probably wrong. What my colleagues and I did is we, we built a, a database. We, we started looking around for, for this information. Then what we saw was that there had been two or three projects that attempted something like this previously, crowdfunded um, and community journalism pieces, uh, killedbypolice.net, um, the Fatal Encounters Project. And then there was also literally a true crime author in Nevada, I think, who was like, I wonder how many people the police killed, and he just did this himself. Now, the best way to do this, because you can't rely on the departments, they don't necessarily have to tell you, they don't report it routinely, the best way to track this is through media reports. That if someone is killed, no matter if it's in the large, if it's New York City, largest market in the world, or it's in middle of nowhere, Montana or Idaho, if someone is killed by a police officer, at least one reporter, one time, will write about it or will stand at their, at their new newscast and say, we're here at the crime scene tape of an officer-involved shooting. And so that the best way to capture this, we concluded, was to set up an elaborate Google alert system and to run unique searches every day and locate every report we could of an officer-involved shooting and then go back and confirm the details of each one. So we, started, we set out to do this, and we had no idea really what, how we were going to do it. We didn't know what we want. We knew we wanted to know the names of people and their races. Were they armed or were they unarmed? We hadn't even begun to have all the fights about is a toy gun and a weapon or not? Is someone in a car armed? or Save that for later, right? And we started building out this database. And what we find, you know, according to those FBI numbers, there had never been more than 460 police shootings. 463 was the most fatal police shootings ever recorded by the FBI. By May of 2015, we'd started in January, we were nearing 500. By the end of the year, we had 991. We'd, we'd found twice as many fatal shootings as the federal government said were happening. And we found that, yes, there were disparities, that while black Americans make up 12% 12, 12 of the population, they make up somewhere between 24 and 30% of the people killed by the police and, and of the unarmed people killed by the police that these were interactions that were happening disproportionately to black and brown Americans. I say that because in a time when our national dialogue is down on the media uh, and the fake news, which I'm a member of, we, I think it's important that we remember the role that a free press can and must play in answering these questions. Right? We had a conversation at the time about Ferguson where many men and women of color knew that this disparity was a reality and had been saying that this disparity was a reality for years. And the majority of our culture and society just chose not to hear them and not to believe them. That we had a conversation that existed solely in emotion and anecdote. Not that that emotion was not valid, nor that those anecdotes were not real. What we were able to do, I hope, and what we attempt to keep doing, we're now in the third year of this database project, is to provide the unimpeachable analytic evidence to back up the lived experiences and realities of the people who we write about. Now, that's not always effective. Those emailers still send me emails about all the reasons why my numbers must not be true. Um, it, it's remarkable how many data scientists know more about the data we created than we do. Um, well, what if you ran it this way? We ran, we ran it that way already. We, we, we did this, we know. But, but, I think that, but I think that's important. I, I think that it's important in our press, it, the story is not only about criminal justice, but any story about a disparity, whether that's disparity in mental health, whether that's disparity in environmental justice, 
I think it's important that our press continues to serve, again, not, not as a voice for the voiceless, but rather as a platform for the unheard, where we are seeking to validate empirically the, the realities of the Americans who we cover. Um, and I think that it's the job of our readers and our viewers and of you, of residents, to continue telling your own stories the way that the people of Ferguson did. I, I think that, you know, now more than ever, people, we all have such a power and an ability to change and influence the world around us simply by raising our voices. Um, that a, a tweet can be seen around the world, a video can be seen around the world. And that those, and that those inputs, those choices, the choices of a Janetta Elzey to go to Ferguson is, in, is what can spark a project that hopefully can help change the way Americans are policed. All right, I'm gonna shut up and take some water and then let's talk. Thank you guys. So if people have questions, I'd be happy to help you with those. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your work and especially for uh, the database. My question concerns uh, the database that's created by your organization, the Washington Post. The numbers in terms of African American shot that you find are not that different than the numbers found in the database that was created in 2012 by Malcolm X grassroots organization, Ghetto Storm. Yes. And while as you said, you still get these kooks who can't accept uh, the empirical data. The reality is that somehow we have to account for why Operation Ghetto Storms numbers, which are quite similar to the numbers that you have at the Post, mm -hmm. the numbers that we find with The Guardian in, uh, in the UK. So it seems to me that there's a question about the source and the analysis because uh, Operation Ghetto Storm and Malcolm X grassroots tied their analysis to an argument about historic terror mm -hmm. of African Americans and to an argument about internal colonialism and the suppression of black nationality. Mm -hmm. That's an, so, and that, that project was an excellent project. Um, the, I think that what, I, what I've come to believe is that the rejection of this empirical data and information is, is not about the source, nor is it about even the analysis, but rather it is about a predetermined conclusion by any number of people and institutions that the answer to the question is not racism and racism is not the problem. That it cannot be a disparity. That it, it can't, that, that the, the, the answer cannot be a racial prejudice or a system uh, that is structured and, and premised in a white supremacy. And it must be something else. And so no matter what is placed in front of some people like this, there is always going to be a retort of, but what about this, or how about this, or that can't really be it, or, but, and we've seen this time and time again. With our numbers, we ran this so many different ways. What if we overlay crime statistics of the neighborhoods of where, where these shootings are happening, does that explain it? What if we go case by case and analyze the threat level posed by the person killed, right? Because you're right, yeah, an unarmed person could be dangerous, right? Yeah. No, in fact, what we found was a white person has to do significantly more to get themselves killed in these circumstances than a black person does. That no matter how we ran this data, no matter how many different ways we tried to test it, and we cannot escape the reality that the single biggest determining factor, especially with an unarmed person, and whether or not they are killed by the police is the color of their skin. And, and the single biggest determining factor in how we experience the police even broadly outside of fatal encounters is the color of their skin. Now, do other factors play in? Of course they do. You know, only a handful of women are killed by police each year. Not that they don't experience police in many other ways, right? Um, many of the people killed are mentally ill or, or in the midst of some type of mental health crisis. 
Many are dealing with drugs and alcohol. Uh, poverty and class certainly play in. They, they factor in. But there's, from what we found, it's, race is inescapable in the explanation. Now again, not to repeat myself, but there are people who are incentivized to not accept that reality. There are people for which the conversation begins by rejecting the idea that race must play a factor. And I think that, become, that is what becomes difficult. And part of that, I think, is because of uh, the elementary level in which often we discuss race and are capable of discussing race. That if we acknowledge, that acknowledging that race is a factor in our daily lives is in fact an indictment upon all of us, right? That we, that we all live within a structure where this factors in. Now for people who grow up every day dealing with the reality of our race and how it impacts our lives, that's not news. Oh yeah, race is a thing, it, it, we know. But for many people, who perhaps have gotten into adulthood without really having, feeling as if they have, race has impacted the, the outcomes of their lives in part most likely because the way their outcome has been affected is to have it be privileged. It, it is a remarkably uncomfortable premise to think that other people's lives have somehow been affected uh, and, yours, and yours has been advantaged. And so, like I said, I think that in many ways it's not, it's not even about the sources. We're all finding the same things. We all, and that's one of the things I've enjoyed about, enjoyed is not the right word, but there have been several data projects along these lines, and we've come to the same conclusions, right? No matter, they did this a little bit differently, we did this a little, but the top lines are all the same. Racial disparities, the, the wide um, need for more mental health services, the need for de-escalation, I mean, it's clear. And, and I think that what's interesting, and I, I'm gonna shut up after this, the, some of my colleagues and I uh, have gone back and we've read a lot of Ida B. Wells, um, and the work in writing she did on lynchings. And I've been using this line now in conversations about what's the role of a journalist, and specifically a black journalist, in an age in which it feels that empirical fact is not necessarily valued. And what I think, I'm only halfway through the second biography of her, but what, I, what I'm pretty sure is that Ida B. Wells didn't write about a lynching to think that people would read the article and say, we can, well, we're never gonna do that again. That was terrible. But the reality was it was her job as a journalist to, to create this record for history, whether, whether the truth was valued in that moment or not. And that we have a better understanding of the world in which we live because people took the time to write true things down, whether their colleagues and friends and nation believed them or listened to them at the time or not. I fear that that is part of what the reality of this era of reporting will be like. That 50 years from now, someone is going to write the new Jim Crow on police shooting. Someone is going to write slavery by another name on policing, right? And they're going to say, look, actually, they, look at the Washington Post and the Guardian. They did all, these, all this data back then, and, we can see, and, and hopefully by then, people will be willing to accept the things that are in front of them. I'm not really sure. I know that was uplifting, but. <laughs> Hello, sir. Thank you for all your comments today. It's uh, been great to hear. Oh, it's been great to hear your outsider's perspective. Me and my colleagues here, we're actually from the St. Louis area. I'm born and raised in St. Louis. I actually just bailed a friend out of a St. Louis County jail just before we got here. So a lot of my anecdotal observations is that not much has changed. I teach in a rural school district where at the time, hands up, don't shoot was a punchline because it did not fit the narrative of what the police reported. And a lot of what I still see is that no matter what data is discovered, no matter what, what's being reported, we cannot persuade. So I guess my question for you is how do we move forward? How do we move the unmovable? Thank you. I, I think that I think that we do it in part by, I mentioned Duray McKesson earlier. Um, he, he talks about his idea, he says that protest in many ways is telling the truth in public. Um, and someone commented I think on my Facebook page or something at some point, or in a review of the book, that, the, that in many ways in the times in which we live, simply telling the truth is an act of protest, right? And seeing that in both directions. And I, and I genuinely, I, I believe that. 
I think was also, and it's difficult, right? And it's a, it's a burden that I don't know that we can, each of us individually takes on, but we as a collective do take on, is that one of the ways we move the unmovable is by continuing to push, right? I, I'm, I'm su pleasantly surprised time and time again, because these come in waves. I, I, des I describe the kind of growth of Black Lives Matter as in many ways a four wave series. You have the, you have what, in 2012 you have the, the movie Fruitvale Station, which depicts Oscar Grant's death, which was in 2009. You have the deaths of Jordan Davis and Trayvon Martin, and then the trials that, that are related to them. And that is that first critical moment. Then you get to 2014, where you have Eric Gardner, John Crawford, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice. 2015, you have Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, uh, Sandra Bland, Sam DuBose, and then 2016, you have Philando Castillo, Alton Sterling, the shootings of the officers in Baton Rouge and Dallas, as well as then Terrence Crutcher, Seville Smith in Milwaukee. Um, and so what, what I think, what, one of the things I, I find heartening in some ways, and this is, I mean, all of this is a miserable context to be encouraged by anything in, right? But it's how readers who have emailed me racist nonsense for all the way through phase one and phase two and phase three, I, I mean, in, I know these individuals. I know, that Philando Castillo shooting seal was, was crazy. That meant, did you see that video? Maybe there is a problem here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, we, we've had like 19 emails and they're like, what? what? Where, where for people who do not live this experience, the drum beat does over time. They didn't pay attention to the first one. All they knew was the hands up, don't shoot from, from Michael Brown. They didn't really pay attention to, to that, that we all have different moments. I keep stealing DeRay's lines, but he said, you know, you know, that like no one's born woke, something had to wake you up. Like this idea in that we all are woken up by different things and at different points. So this, this is a journey, different people are jumping on at different points in it. And that as different people jump in, that creates space for some of us to say, all right, this is your fight now. Or I'm taking, I'm taking this one off. But I think that that's a big part of it. And I, I do think it, it, there's a big debate in black journalism circles very often about what is the role of the black journalist or the black public intellectual as it relates to explaining to people who do not understand. And I fall on one extreme of that, um, different than some of my colleagues, and, that, and I think that it, is, that it is my job as a journalist to be an educator. That if, it, as I said earlier, if you read something I write and you don't understand it, I have failed. And that if you reach out to me and clearly have misunderstood the point and clearly don't get it, that I, I do play a role in trying to teach you and explain it to you. I think that what I also think is interesting is that so many of those people who send me emails or make calls or tweet stuff at me, while they're not necessarily doing it in the most friendly or it doesn't always feel like the most good faith ways are reaching out because I'm the closest thing to a, a black friend they have. That guy from the newspaper who they yell at about how I'm wrong about everything, right? That they, that they want to talk about this police shooting thing and what are they going to do besides talk to that black guy from the Washington Post? I think there is a role, in, so, I, so I try to balance that and think about that in terms of what is the responsibility to, if I want to live in a world, I want my children one day to live in a world where um, that is incrementally at least better, where, where they're less likely to, to be encountered by people who are so confused and, uh, and ignorant and unaware of the racial realities. One step towards that is by engaging in conversation with those people. So I think that, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I, it's literally my job to watch all these videos, and there are videos I don't watch. 
Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to make decisions about our consumption. And I think there is a level of moderation that's important across the board that, you know, I've said this from the very beginning of taking this job, that the moment I can watch someone be killed on tape and it not affect me, I need to get a different job, right? Like it should give me, it, this, I'm watching someone die, right? Um, and that's before overlaying the reality that this is someone who might look like my brothers or my father or me, right? You know? The, I think that, but one of the things that is well, interesting and difficult about this moment and about this specific topic is that this is truly a local issue in every place. That there are 18 to 19,000 police departments in the United States of America. They are their own bosses. Um, that the, the Attorney General of the United States can't really tell them what to do. The President can't really tell them what to do. Short of some omnibus legislation that we know is never going to get through Congress, there's, the federal government actually has very little power over the training and policies of our local police departments. That power, rather, is consolidated locally. And so this is a case in which it's important for that pain and that anger, that mobilization, that feeling of what can I do and I need to do something, it's important that that's channeled then in, in hyper-local ways. In many cases, it's your department needs to adopt this policy, right? That, that this is, again, it's both the beauty and the difficulty of this individual issue is that it's a battle that has to be fought in 19,000 individual places. But that empowers people, wherever they are as they watch a video, there is an actual physical actionable thing you can do. That thing doesn't need to be go to Ferguson or Baltimore, although people go and that's fine. It can be figuring out what's in your police union contract, figuring out how this would be handled here. What is on the books now? How do we preventive, preventatively attempt to, um, you know, to keep this from happening? And I think that that's a big part of it. I mean, I think I'm in a position of privilege in that we all, when we watch these videos or we see these incidents, there's this feel, it's a human feeling of what I need to do something, what can I do? And my position of privilege is that I have a very clear lane of what I'm supposed to do. My job is to start asking questions and getting answers. Um, and I think that's one of the only reasons I've been able to do this even as long as I've done it now is that I don't have a moment to even digest or think about it. It's I need to start making phone calls and I need to book a t plane ticket, I need to go. And, and I think that I can understand why it's, it's very, I talk to people all the time who get so frustrated at not f knowing when feeling like, what can I do right now? And like I said, I would really encourage that involvement at the local level and that thought process about what does this look like where I am? Um, because the reality is, and we saw this, when Ferguson first happened, all the kind of commentary was about how this must be some backwatered racist place in the middle of Missouri, blah, blah, blah. That could never happen here, right? And all the cities afterwards are all like, well, we're no Ferguson, believe me. Like Cleveland's like, we're not Ferguson. And Charleston's like, we're not Ferguson. And I think I said it's on the back of my book cover. It's like the, the story of Ferguson's the story of America, right? That, that, the, that this is a universal story in all of these different places. And so again, uh, what you're watching on film may not have happened on your block or on your street, but it could. And so I think there's the same applications. And sometimes it's easier to make changes when your place is not the place having the conversation than otherwise. Good afternoon. Oh, Good afternoon. Okay. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. I was wondering your opinion on censorship um, on multiple levels. Um, I think that it was eye-opening for a lot of people to just learn about like the separation between federal and local, but mm -hmm. I think that there's also a lot of censorship on a part of institutions in general and what they will talk about and what they won't talk about. And so specifically as a psychologist, the issues that we're facing where we're from is access to health care. Um, and things that are being cut in mental health services. Mm -hmm. And as a psychologist, many times on our listservs or many times on um, our discussion boards or meetings, we're told like these are not things we can talk about even though they affect our clients or even though they affect our media. And these are like laws and things that are going on at a local mm -hmm. municipality level. So I was wondering how you as a journalist really feel like we're gonna be able to get these messages out when the institutions we're working for and the community level um, assemblymen that we work are trying to work with are saying these are not topics we wanna talk about. It's something we encounter a lot as, as a reporter, as a journalist, we encounter this often. I can't, 
I couldn't even begin to list the number of times that I've known about something or known of something. Or someone has come to me, you got to write about this. This is important. This is happening. And that we're never able to because we cannot, because there has either been such intimidation or such structural obfuscation where we cannot actually codify and, and source the information to get it out to the public, right? I, I think now more than ever, it's important to have people, that people are willing to talk about the world they live in and their realities. I, I think that we just, the Post just uh, adopted a new slogan, which is a little hokey, but, uh, but I'm fine with it, where, where they, are, now under our masthead it says, democracy dies in darkness, is our like, catchphrase. Sounds like a bad, like, like Batman 3, like, yeah. <laughs> democracy dies in darkness. The, but I believe that to be true broadly, right? No matter how weird of a catchphrase is. You know, like, that, that we all know, no matter what field we work in or, or, or what we do, we have our fingers on the pulse of reality about our sector of life in a way that the public does not necessarily. We know what is true and what is not. We know what people are not noticing and what they don't get. I think now it's, I said, more important than ever that people take the chance and the risk that accompanies it to speak truth in public and to have those conversations. And at times to put their name on those things. Um, I, you know, I, I think that that as, as someone who writes and who tries very hard to not use very many anonymous sources ever, it, that to, to make the argument that it's important that the public can't dismiss this truth because, oh, well, but who said that? Some anonymous person? We can't. I, I think that's really important. Now, I think that's easier than it has been previously because there are so many more media outlets and platforms. It's easier to write and publish an op-ed now. It's easier to, uh, to uh, publish things yourself on social media or you know, in places like that. But I also think that it, it requires in many ways, and all of this is about superseding the attempts at, at coordinated censorship or silencing. I, I think in any field, in any sector, it's important to think about what is the truth we know that the public should? And how do we go about making that happen? Um, and that requires some coordination. That requires conversation. That requires finding people who you trust to help tell those things. But I also think it's easier now to do that than ever before. Um, you know, journalists used to be, especially reporters, we used to be these disembodied names that sat at the top of stories. We didn't have, you didn't know what we looked like or who we were. You could infer, um, you know, perhaps some things based on what our name is, right? You know, but, but, you, but we weren't necessarily personalities, and that was, there was the point behind that. But we live in a world now, especially with social media, where the people who follow my work know who I am. They know me personally. They know, um, they probably know that I'm in New York right now because I might have Instagrammed from here, right? They know that, I, you know, like, that, and so because of that, I think it can be easier now if someone desires to find someone who they trust to tell their story uh, or to tell those things. And I think that it's important that people utilize that and use that as a means of kind of getting those truths out there, even at times when powerful people and powerful institutions do not want those things out. Hi, how are you doing? Um, so I sat through... Um, Janet Helm's presentation yesterday, and I just wanted your kind of your insight and input into what role does the press play in the invisibility of black women and toward police violence? I think that the press plays a major role, and I think that the press, you know, I'm, I'm a critic of the press as, as much as anyone, as, uh, despite my love for it. I think that one of the keys is understanding that the press is an institution, as is as are the police, as is the government, as is everything else. That we are an institution seeped and premised in both white supremacy and patriarchy. That we are as guilty as anyone else in advancing stereotypes in um, magnifying underrepresentations and misrepresentations. And I think it's our job as a conscious and an aware press to work actively to undo some of that. You know, the, 
when a media portrayal is misrepresentative, it skews the truth and it skews reality. And I think it's our job collectively to attempt to bend those perceptions back towards reality. Um, I, it's, unsur- it's unsurprising to me that stories of black and brown Americans are undertold in our mainstream media um, because I know that our mainstream, because I know that black and brown people are underrepresented in our mainstream media. And as you drill into that further, as you speak about black women or women of color, you know, is the further you go in, the more someone is underrepresented in the media itself, the, the more their stories are going to either be misrepresented or underrepresented in the coverage, right? And so I think that the media diversity element of that is extremely important. Are black women decision makers in these media spaces? Are they directing coverage? Are they producing the coverage? Are they making the editorial decisions? Are they? I think that's really important. I think what's also difficult is in our conversations about police violence, statistically, police violence manifests differently as it relates to women than it does to men. Um, it is not that women are not killed by the police, it's that many more men are killed by the police. However, police violence um, against women manifests in many other ways, specifically um, through sexual assaults and harassment, right? Um, I think that it can be, I, I, I think that we at times in our coverage can miss or underrepresent that reality in part because of gender disparities in who is writing these stories. Um, and, and also because of, you know, for better or worse, when there's a, a body, we write about it. There's, an under, there's, there's less of a need to have to justify why this is important. Someone's dead, there they are. And I think that we have structural and institutional biases sometimes that prevent us from accurately and adequately telling stories about trauma that is inflicted specifically on women. Um, because there's a patriarchal delegitimization, or de- de- delegitimizing of that trauma, that it must not be as bad as these other things. I, I think that that's probably a big part of it as well. Um, and so I don't have like a huge silver bullet to fix that, other than empowering more women within the media itself in decision-making roles, because I think that is what really helps change that. Oh, thank you. So again, we just want to say uh, thank you so much to Mr. Lowry for being here with us today. We also uh, want to recognize his work. And I just want to extend kind of a personal thank you. Um, I actually also grew up in North St. Louis. I grew up in the predominantly white neighborhood that's right next to Ferguson called uh, Florissant, Missouri. And I had family uh, who were a part of the protests and who felt like it was really important as white allies to be present. And so I just wanna thank uh, Mr. Lowry for his work um, from a very kind of personal connection to that movement. Um, And I also just wanna turn over to Rudy to uh, present the award. Okay, so please join me in presenting the Social Justice Action Award to Mr. Wesley Lowry uh, by Teachers College, Columbia University on February 25th, 2017 to honor his commitment to promoting equity, justice, and progress for all.